Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Gillian Mackay, MSP, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2024 Festival of Politics. This year celebrates the festival's 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in five days of spirited debate. I look forward to the discussion and hearing everyone's thoughts and views. And it's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences of opinion, and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. We're delighted that you can join us today to participate in 25 years of the Scottish Parliament. Where are the young women? In partnership with the Young Women's Movement and the Scottish Youth Parliament. And later, I'll be inviting you to get involved with questions and comments. It will appear behind us. Uh, if you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so by using um, at visit Scott Parle on uh, X or on Instagram is just at Scott Parle. I should also add that this event is being recorded and will be available on the Scottish Parliament's Twi YouTube channel later today. And I'm very pleased to be joined this afternoon by Professor Meryl Kenny, Grace McCabe and Daniela Onyewenyi, MSYP. So Professor Meryl Kenny is a Professor of Gender and Politics at the University of Edinburgh and a member of the Scottish Parliament's Gender Sensi Sensitive Advisory Committee. She has published widely in the areas of gender and political parties, political representation, Scottish and British politics and institutional change. Grace McCabe is a member of the Young Women's Movement. She has been a member of the Young Women's Movement Advisory Collective for two years and loves the fact it offers a space to have conversations with like-minded young women and want to build a better Scotland. Grace believes that young women are experts in their own lives and deserve to be represented in every place that decisions are being made which affect them. And Daniela Onyewenyi, MSYP, has been a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament for Paisley since 2022 and has been heavily involved with her local youth charity prior to the by-election that she won. She is currently a trustee for SYP's all-female board and is going to study law with Spanish. So there will be an opportunity, as I said, for everyone to put questions to the panel. And while we're going on, please do send them in so there's not that weird, awkward silence at the end of the questions that I have. Um, so please do get them in and we'll make sure that we get as many of them as possible asked. However, I'm going to start by asking um, our panellists to contribute to a few questions, and I've grouped um, three of them for us to start with. So the first one is, what does politics mean to you, and what has your experience been so far? What do you think the key barriers are to young women standing for election, and what could political parties do to support young women to become candidates? Professor Kenny, could I come to you first? Yes, so um, in terms of politics uh, and, and what it means to me, um, I think what's really important is that politics is about power and power is everywhere. So politics is everywhere. And I think that often when we talk about politics or we study politics or we write about politics, we think about it in terms of these kinds of spaces, formal institutions with doors and windows and serious things going on. But politics happens in the home. It happens in the workplace. It happens in universities. Um, and those are just as important, if not more so, and shape what's happening in these kinds of spaces. Yeah. Absolutely. So what do you think the key barriers are to young women standing for election? And what, what do you think political parties, certainly from your, from your research, what do you think they could do better to support young women and youngish women, as I keep referring to myself. <laughs> um, no, I got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Young Greens at 30. That was curtains for my youth. Um, so youngish, um, what do we need to do to get young women into politics and then to keep them in politics as well? Because it's so important that we keep them there as well as getting them in in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, to set the scene, that, that young, uh, young people's representation is really low. It's really low. Um, here, it's really low globally. So less than 3% of parliamentarians around the world are under the age of 30, 
right? Um, a stat I really like, which is, uh, I don't like it, but I think it's quite a useful stat, is from my colleague Michael Gran at Uppsala University, which in the most recent um, European Parliament, before these most recent elections, the number of members of the European Parliament under 30 was the same as the number of MEPs named Martin, six, yeah. right? So it's a very stark um, underrepresentation. And I think young women are at a particular intersection where there's a particular kind of model of what a good politician or a good candidate is, which uh, is based around kind of ideas of what experience is, uh, full time, unbroken work records, resources, networks, etc. And those can be doubly hard for young women or, or um, candidates at, at the intersection of multiple identities to, to navigate. So parties are both one of the main barriers mm -hmm. because um, in the selection process um, they, there will be particular questions or ideas about who is an experienced uh, uh, candidate and a good candidate and a good politician which can be particularly hard for young people, the kind of expectations around um, financial resources to run a campaign, the time to run a campaign, um, you know, your work situation and how you might be balancing it with other things, um, care, those kinds of things and how those might hit particular identities. But that also means that parties are one of the main solutions, right, in terms of the kinds of actions that parties can take. So I think there are things around opening up job descriptions and person specifications and thinking about what is a candidate? What do we need a candidate to be? Uh, what do we need a, a, an MSP or an MP or, or to be? There's also things around exploring different ways of doing the work of politics, things like job sharing and things like that and how those might open up different paths. I think particularly with young women coming in, thinking about things around childcare, around maternity leave, um, around work-life balance and those kinds of things are really important. And then there are also harder measures that parties can take, and some parties have taken around um, quota measures, right, where you either uh, reserve a kind of percentage of seats or target for, for young representation. So the Swedish Social Democrats, like every fourth place is someone under 35 on their lists. Um, but also um, things where you might think about, again, um, combining quotas, quotas for women as well as quotas for young people or quotas around ethnicity and quotas for young people, for example, to increase also um, representation at those intersections. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So I'll come to I'll come to Grace next. So for for you, what does what does politics mean? What are the key barriers that you see and have experienced in terms of engaging in, in politics as a, as a whole and what do you think political parties could do better? So politics to me is any space where decisions or conversations are being had about changing the norm or changing the way that things are done. Um, and in terms of my experience with politics, it's definitely a space that I want to break into when I'm older. And I'm saying when I'm older because I feel like I'm currently not able to. Mm -hmm. I think that young women like myself <laughs> have this deep fear of being seen as being silly. Mm -hmm. Like our experience doesn't matter. Um, anytime a young person is elected to parliament, all that's ever commented online is they don't have enough experience. What kind of life experience have we got? If you think about people my age, I'm 21. Um, any 21 year old has a huge breadth of of life experience, but especially people my age, you know, our education was impacted mm -hmm. by COVID. We're growing up in the cost of living crisis. We're probably experiencing financial pressures that we never would have experienced before. And I do believe that you can only be what you can see. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely in favour of gender and age quotas um, because it's so difficult to drag a seat to the table yourself. Mm -hmm. Someone has to hold space for you and that's why I love the Young Women's Movement because I've always been taken seriously and everything I've ever said has been, you know, listened to and highly regarded. Um, and I, that's what I think has to happen with political parties is we do need to hold space for young women and we need to understand that our experience is so, so valuable. We can't mm -hmm. have people making decisions when they haven't walked in our shoes. I think the average age of a parliamentarian um, regardless of gender, is 50. Mm -hmm. um, so my mum's in her 50s and she's an incredibly intelligent woman, but she hasn't lived my life and she can't make decisions for me. So why should anybody else be doing that? That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important reflection as well, actually, of how, how things can change so quickly and how policies can have an impact in that next 
generation coming up has seen the impact of those and actually has their own ideas on on change as well. Yeah. Daniela, do you want to tell us all about your journey into being an MSYP yeah. and what politics means to you, what you want to do in, in politics, what barriers you've experienced um, as part of your, your political journey and your political expression and what you think the, the political parties could do to hold that space for, for young women? Okay, well, to start off, um, politics to me goes beyond the connotations of having like to go out and vote and stuff like that. I think the way politics is in our society, it is ingrained in every little aspect of our lives. It just goes beyond of what we think. Um, so for me personally, I'm a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Um, so although we are an apolitical um, institution, that doesn't stop us from helping and um, essentially carrying out jobs um, that quote-unquote politicians would do. Um, examples are that is um, Scotland's being the first nation to provide free period products for um, anyone that needs it. And those are the things that um, the way politics affects me um, and my experience personally. Within SYP as an organisation, I've been part of the movement, which is an anti-racist organisation um, or like a little working group, I'd say, which aims to kind of make SYP an anti-racist place, um, provide um, a safe place for um, young ethnic minorities to share their experiences and whatnot. Um, and that has evolved into this, um, this year where um, we, as a group, we carried out... Um, we carried out essentially um, trainings for young MSYPs and the staff and also um, the support workers because um, we think it's important um, being anti-racist in this day and age um, and that's me personally. Now, my, a key barrier um, for young women in politics for me is visibility. But visibility, the problem with visibility is due to those said key barriers. Um, I do understand um, that being in a place, sometimes you, you're not always able to see yourself. And I do acknowledge that fact, but that, uh, and it is difficult to be like the first person to do things. Um, but I also believe seeing somebody there, seeing yourself represented is imperative for, to see young women in such spaces. And I don't think we see that many, that often. And I think that is a very, big barrier that we have at the moment. And for political parties to support us young women, I'd say having like visible policies to show that there are key policies there to support them, or to support us, I should say. Um, making sure that, yes, you are, yes, we made it into a place, but are we supported in that place, or are we just there to just like tick off a diversity quota? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'd say that. So, yeah. No, I think that's I think that's really useful, and I, th I suppose that leads me nicely onto the onto the next question I have. So, obviously, beyond just political parties, there are then the political institutions. There is this place. There's Westminster. There's local authorities and things like that as well. So, given your comments just there, Daniela, on being able to see yourself represented in a place, do you see yourself represented in the in the Scottish Parliament at the at the moment? And what do you think? political institutions like the Parliament could do to become more accessible and easier for, for young women to engage with or see themselves being, being part of and being MSPs? Um, to put it quite frankly, no. I do not see myself uh, represented. And I think that is also um, a reason why I decided not to pursue politics in university and decided to take down the law route. Because not only myself, I didn't think that would was going to be a place for me to thrive and it's also like a sentiment that um, my parents carry and I think it's a societal thing that we need to break down, um, which for the Scottish Parliament as a political institution, for them to become more accessible, it's, it's not necessarily what they can do, it's more of what society as a whole can do because what they are as an institution are just like portraying what society believes in in itself. So I wouldn't say um, 
Well, I would say that the Scottish Parliament can do something as an entity, but I think we should more focus on what um, society as a whole can do to kind of make the Parliament and other political institutions more accessible for young women. Okay. Um, Grace, what do you think political institutions like the Scottish Parliament could do to become more accessible? If you see yourself being an elected representative, what do you think here could do to make it easier, more attractive for yourself and for peers to be able to see themselves as part of, part of this place? So I do see myself represented and I'm fortunate in that sense, but the young women that are elected here, um, they're the same in the sense that they are very high achievers, very, very well educated. They have it all. And I do think as a young woman, you are not taken seriously unless you have it all together. We always have to go the extra mile. We have to look a certain way. We have to be a certain way. We have to talk a certain way. And I am that. And I do acknowledge that I have an enormous amount of privilege just being able to walk down the street and I look like this. And usually people listen to what I'm saying. But what I also see is that younger politicians, younger female politicians that I look up to, a lot of them naturally want to go off. They want to have a family. They want to get married. They want to settle down in a sense. And you should be able to have it all, but you can in this line of work, you can. Um, I think that councillors are massively underpaid. There's some fantastic young female councillors and their job is paid part-time. It's not even just a full-time job, it's your whole life as being a councillor. And it gets to the stage where they are so selfless for their constituents, but also for their families, that they have to give up a job that they love so much. So yes, I do see myself represented, but I also see the fact that I could do really well once I graduate. Like I'm also a law student, um, and I've kind of prepped myself to be to do as well as possible in these spaces because I have to do that. I have to go the extra mile. But I do see that I might get to my mid thirties and start to struggle because I'm not being supported in the way that I should be. Another thing that I really want to touch on is we have to have an absolutely zero tolerance policy to any form of misogynistic abuse mm -hmm. at all. Um, the things that I do, I've got a fairly public persona mm -hmm. um, and I've received like torrents of misogynistic abuse throughout my lifetime for the way I look, for the way that I talk, for the things that I believe in. And I've got an incredibly thick skin, obviously, because I'm sitting here just now, but I shouldn't have had to do that. Yeah. I shouldn't have had to accept that misogynistic abuse is kind of the inevitable and I'm going to have to move past it. Now, whenever someone publishes an article on me or I do something like this, I just expect the comments. Um, I shouldn't have to do that. And I think that it's just the fact that I have been faced. So I became a spokesperson for Girl Guide in Scotland when I was 15, 21 now, so it's nearly six years. I've had nearly six years of everything I do and everything I say and how I look being scrutinised to an extreme extent. And that's what I see with young female politicians as well. And we do move past it, but we shouldn't have to do that. So I can completely understand why a phenomenal other 21 year old woman who has never done any of the things that I've done steps into a space like this, receives huge amounts of abuse and goes, do you know what, I just can't take it. So I think we really have to work as an institution, but also as a society, we have to stop holding young women to the standards of perfection that we currently do. Yeah, and it's how we it's how we have those thick skins as well, without normalising that behaviour. And there ha there is definitely a thing in here amongst the the women who are represented in in Parliament that we are expected to shrug off a lot of the things that that we see and that we hear about ourselves and that that get commented. So, uh, unfortunately that doesn't seem to get any better, <laughs> even being a bit older than, than yourselves. Um, Professor Kenny, what, same question to you. What could political institutions like the Parliament do to become more accessible? I think part of the issue is, as has already been highlighted, is this kind of vicious circle, right? That, that kind of um, lack of representation in these spaces exacerbates kind of disillusion and disenchantment with politics, which may make you less likely to participate through conventional kind of means of political participation, like voting and things. And that in turn means parties are less 
less interested in catering to groups that, that don't turn out or aren't their kind of core constituents, or it's used as a sign that young people don't want to participate in politics rather than politics is not inclusive of. Um, so it's, it's also the kind of importance of flipping the question. I think some of the, some of the in thinking of the kind of wider work that's going in on a, in the parliament around kind of gender sensitizing the parliament and, and the, you know, the early years of devolution and thinking about an inclusive kind of parliament um, with different kind of perspectives in it are around the formal rules and spaces and whether they're accessible and inclusive and some of the things we've already talked about are kind of work-life balance and sitting hours and family friendliness and those kinds of things. But some of, I think, what we're talking about is also about the ways people act informally in those spaces and the kind of informal ways of doing things and the cultures and so on. And those are sometimes harder to shift, though formal rules can help shift them. And I think um, some of the research on young women in politics shows how their kind of competence and legitimacy is, is questioned to a greater degree, um, you know, that they're often kind of mistaken for secretaries or assistants in spaces, the kind of scrutiny that Grace talked about in terms of media scrutiny, of dress, of, of speech, of those kinds of things. I remember a quote in a kind of Swedish study where young women were saying, well, I started wearing glasses because I looked more Ser serious, you know, kind of in those spaces, names forgotten, you know, those kinds of daily kind of microaggressions and, and experiences of everyday sexism, as well as the kind of um, violence against women in politics, um, which affects um, all groups, but maybe particularly acute, particularly around generational issues and engagement with social media and those kinds of things as well. Um, so I think it's both about formal rules, but thinking about how those kinds of conversations can also shift the informal ways of doing things in these institutions and ways that make them more inclusive. Yeah, and I think some of the problem we've, we've got there is how we make the, the formal rules and things interesting enough <laughs> to engage with and, and, have that, and have that move across because parliamentary standing orders is not necessarily everybody's yeah, yeah. the first thing you pick up in the morning, but it does absolutely drive that, yeah. that, wider, that wider culture and things as well. But I think also because parliament's political institutions are fundamentally based on seniority. Yes. The whole structure of a parliament is based on seniority. So mm -hmm. that that has particular consequences for, and it, the farther you go up the political hierarchy, when you think about cabinets and governments, the fewer young people there are. So, so it's, yes. it's also about within the institution, who has the power, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and it's even interesting the way the parties organise themselves within the institution as well, and who holds sort of what senior positions, even within the political parties within, mm -hmm. within the building um, as well. Um, so what role could education, both formal education through schools, colleges and universities and non-formal education, such as youth work, play in encouraging young women into politics? And Grace, I'm going to come to you first again, because I think through the young women's movement, I think you've probably got an awful lot of insight into the, the youth work side of, side of things with that question. Yeah, I would say that... Um in my experience, it's mainly been the non-formal education that's got me to the place that I am just now. So things like the Young Women Lead programme um, analyses the democratic well-being of young women. Um, things like Speak Out at Girl Guiding Scotland puts girls directly in charge of creating the change that they want to see in the world. Um, it's maybe just pushing, pushing programmes like that and making girls and young women feel welcome in spaces like that, um, but I think quite often what I see in the young people that I work with is that spaces like that are an escape from the pressures they face at school and the pressures they face at work because they don't feel like school is equipping them with the skills they need to go off and do truly what they want, but also that they might not feel heard by their peers or their teachers or um, they might not feel supported or safeguarded enough. Um, so I think that in terms of non-formal education in Scotland, we're actually very, very fortunate um, with the direction that we're going in. But we need to make those spaces more visible for the people that actually need it. We've got, like anyone in youth work will know, we've got a really like engaged cohort of young people like kind of waiting in the wings that are probably all going to be elected MS in the next 10 years but it's not fair that just that group are getting opportunities we really have to do the work to keep reaching out um, 
Yeah, I wish I had the answers, but I will say that youth work is really, it's changing the world. But that's why we're having this conversation today, because quite often the experiences actually lead to finding, finding some of those um, answers. Uh, Daniela, in your, in your experience, obviously, as a member of the, the youth parliament, the sort of structural political side of things and getting stuff done, um, I know I've been taught an awful lot in, in this role as an MSP and there's never a, there's never a day that's not a school day um, in, this, in this job. How have you found the, um, the youth parliament sides of things versus what you, what you learned in, in formal education about political representation and, and how that shaped what you're, what you're doing? I honestly think there is um, more young women involved um, with like the Scottish Youth Parliament, like for example, as of recently, I was elected in an all-female board um, as trustee. Um, I I don't I think I feel like there is a big jump between like um, even within school and then like youth work and then actual parliament. I feel like within schools, within youth work, women are actually engaged. Like girls are actually engaged with like being, for example, um, um, in my own school, like going for like head girl or deputy head girl. Loads of girls are going for it. Loads of girls are confident to go it. Look at the boys, not that many. Same thing for the um for going for the board. Loads of girls are going up for the board, not that many boys. And then you see a big jump and it's like why what wh why this disparity what happened and I genuinely think it's just confidence. I think young women want to be in those spaces but they think this is too much for me. I cannot do it at this level because there is there is a clear um, interest to do it. Like I clearly see an interest of young women and girls wanting to take up leadership roles. <laughs> I just think some of us doubt ourselves a bit too much and don't give ourselves enough credit <coughs> and where is due. Because um, me personally, I know lots of fantastic young women which they will thrive in leadership spaces, but I feel like they just don't see themselves in that space, which is a shame because they do belong there. Um, but yeah, as of what to encourage young women in politics, I think just putting like more emphasis in those places and skills and youth work that they can continue this and it can become a career and they can thrive. Like unless what, unlike what I believe, like I said earlier, that I don't think I could thrive, there are young women that they could do that. Maybe myself in another universe, I guess, <laughs> but uh, maybe not this one. But yeah, I think it's just. Um, planting that seed of confidence and planting that seed that if you can do it at a local level, if you can do it in your own school, if you can do it in your own constituency, then of course you can do it in a national level. For both of you, do you think it's about talking about politics beyond just electoral politics as well, beyond just being the MSP? Because there's so, much, so many other ways. Some of the great organisations we have in the room are involved in politics and are involved in shaping what we do. But it's not necessarily being the one in the chamber doing the speech and, and all the other things we have to do. So do you think there's, there's, a, there's a role for, for lots of different leadership groups, MSPs, other people as well, to actually make that point that politics is not just about being the person in the council chamber, being the person in the, in the parliament chamber, and actually there's other ways to, to get involved and affect change? Yeah, um, I was the token political friend at school. And <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's got yeah. one. And, and if you don't, it's you. It's <laughs> you. Um, and I have to say, the 2021 Scottish parliamentary elections were the highlight of my youth. I was 17, <laughs> I could vote, and I was just ecstatic about it. And I had friends, mostly girls, come up to me, because I suppose the subjects that I took at school, everyone was kind of leaning towards law or politics or economics. So the boys kind of... They went off and they had their conversations with themselves and they were like, we know. But the girls, they would come to me and say, Grace, who should I vote for? And I was like, well, I can't tell you that. Like, that is really kind of a breach of the power that you've, you've given me. But I was like, they were like, I, I don't understand. It doesn't matter to me. My mum doesn't vote. My dad doesn't vote. It doesn't matter to me. And I was like, well, no, think about it. There's free period products sitting in our school toilet right now. Politics got you that. 
-hmm. Friends that were on free school meals, politics got you that. Politics got you the free education at university that you're about to go into. And they were like, oh, oh really? And I was like, yeah, there's these things called manifestos, you should read them. Um, <laughs> Good on them if they did. <laughs> yeah, I read every single one because I was that friend. And I just, I had to... I, it's really long. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, and, um, like, a thing that I did at school was I was working with a charity called Magic Breakfast mm -hmm. and I campaigned alongside them to get universal free breakfast provision included in all of the party manifestos at 17. Well done. Thanks. But it was decisions, <laughs> it was things like that that made my friends go, politics does impact me. Mm -hmm. I've got this say, it's so important, but being... Number one, party politics isn't for everyone. I'm not even really that sure it's for me, but I know that influencing decision-making, etc., and changing policies that affect the lives of young women like myself and policies that don't affect me at all, like that's what I'm really interested in. So I do think that leadership spaces, whether that be like policy work in charities or something, um, we have to kind of show young women that like your voice really really matters mm -hmm. and these are roles that are really potentially more important in influencing the change just because you don't have a vote in your hand um, in the chamber doesn't mean that you can't play a huge role in shaping the Scotland you've got just now so yeah I think that we have to show young women that roles like that do exist but also just really bring it home to them also the world that we live in is quite stark and a lot of the rights that we have just now are hard won. But that was politics too. Mm -hmm. So we have to show young women that, yeah, it is so important, but you are so important and your voice really, really matters. Absolutely. Daniela, what, if, you, if you wouldn't want to be an MSP in this universe, <laughs> can you see yourself affecting change and being involved in politics in another way? And how, how do you think we can better get that across? to young women and, and young women from different parts of Scotland, um, different ethnicities and all those sorts of things as well as to how we can, how we can really get people in there. Because if you can't see yourself in, in politics, then as an MSP, that makes me quite sad for a start um, and would need to do better. But how do, we, how do we get that out there? How can we convince you that <laughs> affecting change is still something that, that can and should be done? Um, probably things like policy making and stuff like that. Like during the um, recent election, um, I was that friend. I was telling people go out and vote. Have you registered to vote? Like, are you sure you're like show me your register. Like I was that. Uh, like I was. Yeah, like, I was prove it. But like um, I couldn't vote myself because I'm not even a British national. But um, I digress. But yeah, like things. <laughs> like things like that. Um, like you don't have to be like I guess the one on the podium or on the pedestal. Like. Being the one like encouraging people, being the one that, telling them, um, like you have a voice, like because um, I'd say most of my friends are like um, like not really interested in politics because I guess they don't think it's something for them because they think they think oh Danielle you're just like you you're just different like you're not they like oh you're just like interested in politics you're, you're like. I don't, I don't know how to say, like, because most of my friends are not, like, um, most of them are, like, from other countries. They're, like, immigrants like myself. Yeah. So they just think, oh, like, you're just a bit different from us. So, like, you can be our own friend that tells us what to do, yeah. which I don't think it's right. I think everyone has a voice um, in politics. And I think even if I'm not on the podium, um, being, like, vocal about it, mm -hmm. I'm mean, like, yeah, you can do X, Y, and Z. Or I'm not shaming people for not knowing I think that is awfully important because it's okay not to know, even from even if you're 16 or even if you're 12, 25. No, that's still young. Even if like 15. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to do a bit like age range. I apologize. Even from. Sorry, <laughs> right, I won't take offence. <laughs> <laughs> you're 16, or like you are um, 80. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a like it doesn't matter in what stage of life you're in, um, like still being like being vulnerable and telling people I'm not confident on what to do. Could you please show me? I think that's a way, great way to have women like involved to show like you don't need to know it all. You yeah. don't need to know every single thing that you need to. This is why 
you should have mentors when you are elected in said place or like in other places yeah. in politics. But yeah. Great, thank you. Professor Kenny, what role could uh, education, both formal and uh, through youth work, play in encouraging young women into politics? So I think, um, as someone who teaches politics, mm -hmm. I think how we teach politics reflects what we were talking about, that we, we tend to teach politics in a very formal way. Mm -hmm. Politics is about uh, parliaments, it's about parties, it's about elections and voting. And then in kind of week 11, when everybody's tired and not coming to class anymore, me or my colleague Sarah Childs over there comes in and we say, women, at the end, because we've been put at the very end of the course, right? But it's not integrated into the course. You're not talking about power um, in a more expansive way. You know, you're not talking about social movements. You're not talking about the kinds of things, I think, that, that matter. Um, alongside all of those formal things. And that shapes, I think, where people can see themselves in those kinds of spaces. Um, and that also ties into what happens earlier in schools and, 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 and those are kind of knock-on effects. But it matters because um, the kind of gap in who says they want to enter a political career, that gap between men and women starts very early. It starts at school, right? And then it gets exacerbated in university and it gets beyond that. Um, and that men are much more likely to say, uh, including young men, are much more likely to say they want to pursue a political career. Um, and they have higher levels of, of what people call political knowledge. But when you break that down and you start to look at it, it's, well, what is valuable knowledge in politics? It isn't the kinds of things you're talking about just as important about, do you know every member of the cabinet or something like that, right? Um, so I think it's a little bit about flipping the question, which is, isn't showing some uncertainty and admitting what you don't know about politics actually a strength that we might want in having people involved in politics rather than an overconfidence about knowing what to do. But also I think about um, how engagement with small p politics might um, be beneficial for big p politics and might eventually lead people to, to move in different in different directions and in different ways. And there's some interesting stuff about looking at young men and women who are involved in parties, like in political parties and youth sections. And yes, women in those kinds of youth sections are less likely than men to want to stand as candidates, but they're not less likely to want other types of political careers, to be involved in the party, to do other kinds of things. So again, it's about, I think, expanding both through education and how we think about these kind of early pipelines about what we think about politics and what matters. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think certainly from, from my experience, having elected representatives being honest about what they don't know mm -hmm. actually does help in, in a lot of these other spaces as well. When we're talking about the small p politics, if there are people on the telly going, mm, maybe don't know all of that, that does sort of help that, that trickle down as well. I say this as a non-clinician health spokesperson who has to admit to clinicians most weeks that I do not know what they're on about and can they tell me again with less acronyms. It's always a problem. So final question that I've got before I move on to the stack. You've all been listening at least. Um, so last year, the Scottish Youth Parliament carried out a consultation to find out about the experiences of MSYPs who identify as women. A particularly prominent theme that came out of this research was the challenges young women faced when engaging with decision makers and other adults outside of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Many young women shared examples of microaggressions such as decision makers giving more credit to male MSYPs, not feeling they were being taken seriously and feeling anxious about engaging with decision makers. What could decision makers, such as MSPs and councillors, do to make sure young women feel able to meaningfully participate in their work? And as an MSYP, Daniela, I think you are absolutely perfect to answer that question. Um, I'd say probably, in my personal opinion, make themselves like more visible and more like open to want to engage. I think there is already a problem of them not wanting to engage with young people as a whole. Um, for example, if, I think it's more prominent if like a young person wants to put forward a motion and that motion is like, kind of links with what they're doing in Parliament, for example, and then your own local like, MS, like, MSP does not want to talk to you about it or anything, that already kind of makes you shy away from like, wanting to do work. And then 
add on to that the intersectionality aspect of being a woman as well and not being taken seriously in other um, aspects of your life, never mind in politics. Um, I think that already makes it more difficult. So in my opinion, I'd say definitely just as like put your put yourself up there, like go speak to your own constituency MS, MSYP because mm -hmm. you'll know who they are through the election. Um, especially on X, I've seen um, during the election when, because what we do at SYP, we like post um, who the MSYP is for each like constituency. I was like, oh, congrats to X, Y, and Z. And sometimes I could see like the local MSP be like, oh, congratulations, can't wait to start working with you. And I think that is so great. Like, you've acknowledged them, you've acknowledged that they got democratically elected by all the young people because they clearly think they're a person that speaks for them um, and voices what the area believes are the problems and the fact that you can acknowledge them as a person and what are willing to work with them, I think that is so great and I think that would break the barrier within young people and also break the further barrier of um, being a young woman. Do you tend to find that there are elected representatives that you see all the time <laughs> and then some that you never see? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> and how do you think... How do you think we can get the ones that you never see um, to engage with the MSYPs? Because I've had some phenomenal engagement, mm -hmm. not trying to blow my own horn as one of the ones that do enga does engage, <laughs> um, but I've had some phenomenal engagement with the MSYPs around um, work we've been doing on vaping and other things as well that give a lot of really good insight and actually what Grace said earlier on about things that we haven't experienced but we know that are a are a problem. So how do you think we can spread that message, make sure that those engagements are, are good so that we get that, so that we can help be that catalyst to get some of that better um, engagement as well? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I'd say even, like, even though I see like, um, like a couple of MSPs, like more than others, I guess, I wouldn't mind like working behind the scenes with my own. Like I don't, I don't need um, for everyone to know that I'm doing. It. Like it's great that, that I share what I'm doing, but like I wouldn't mind if nobody knew that I'm doing X, Y, and Z with my own like um, local um, councillor or whatnot. Is as long as the relationship is there, uh, you don't have to prove it to anyone because it would naturally flourish and it would naturally show itself. Um, so I think it goes back to my previous point, just building that relationship and it will naturally just showcase itself because if you're doing something behind the scenes and it's so great of course it's going to come to light. Do either Grace or Professor Kenny have any thoughts on how we can make elected reps easier for young women to to engage with and not not fear getting in touch with to to solve some of the some of the issues that they're facing? Because that's the absolute basics of big P political engagement is getting some of your getting some of your issues fixed by. Yeah, I, I suppose it's not a specific suggestion, but I think mm. it speaks to a wider question about needing to see young people as mm -hmm. a group that um, needs representation and that is essential to that, including the perspectives of young people, is essential to making good legislation, to making good decisions, to making good policy. And that sounds like a very simple point, but I think mm -hmm. it's not one that most um, parliaments have, have fully adopted, or most parties. Mm -hmm. um, and that, um, um, and, that and, and the kinds of aggression, microaggressions that you're talking about are about a lack of um, respect and acknowledgement of the importance of, of that role. But that so many of the issues that have been highlighted are intergenerational ones yes. where the costs are falling on young people and until that is recognized and the voices of of those that that need to have their interests included are fully recognized and treated as expert treated as uh, competent etc mm -hmm. um uh, I, I would say it's not it's not the responsibility it's the it's the responsibility the other way around right you know which is what what's the duty of the representative yes. yeah absolutely yeah. grace i think um, elected representatives really have to meet young people where they're at. Yep. So my local MSP is more than happy for me to Instagram DM her mm. because email language is it's not something you're born with. We really have to listen to young people in ways 
that they they talk yep. and listen to them in the spaces where they are sharing their opinions. It's quite daunting to look up someone's email and send a really a really long letter to have their secretary pick it up. Um, I think that, and I suppose it's not. It's kind of more the onus is on them to mm -hmm. do the reaching out, but you have to go to the places where young people are sharing their views. You know, um, MSPs have like surgeries yep. and stuff, but they're during the working day when young mm -hmm. people are in school. So I really think they have to sit and take the initiative to put themselves out there because young people are talking about politics and the way that it affects their lives all the time. It's just not necessarily in the areas that. Um, an MSP would hear it, so they do, the onus is really on them to do the reaching out. That's great, that's really useful. So we'll move on to some of the questions that have, that have come in from yourselves, and I really, really like this first question, because um, it very much makes me think of my first year as, a, as an MSP. So um, someone has asked, I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts on how older women can better support young women entering politics and how women in general can support each other, not compete. I'll let you have a think while I come in with some of my reflections from my first year. Some of the MSPs who've been here for a long time were phenomenal in my first year um, as an MSP and were, were really, really good at sharing their experience of how they'd done things previously, what they'd done in some of these situations and offering support um, when the inevitable things happen and there's a big story that blows up about how you spoke in a certain interview or, or anything like that. And I've actually found that that's probably one of, the most, one of the most positive experiences from the first year. And they weren't always MSPs from my own party and things as well, which was really, which was quite surprising for me. I expected it to be a lot more, everybody stays with themselves, than it actually than it actually is. So I think just that level of it's OK, we've been through this, here is how we dealt with it and here's how we can help is always is always a useful thing and sharing that institutional knowledge because it's not done by osmosis. Um, it doesn't just appear in your lap in your first week as an MSP, here's how to do it. Um, so yeah, that's certainly a way in here that I've found that that some of the some of the older women and I'll never, they'll never forgive me for that. Um, <laughs> I can hear it now. Um, that they've that they've supported that they've supported me. Does anyone else want to come in on this, Professor Kenny? Um, I think the important thing to say about I got a very obvious thing, but to say about age and politics is, of course, you get older, right? Linear uh, progression. Linear time progression is a is, thing. Time is a thing. <laughs> And um, but what that means is that this is a constantly yeah. moving gen. So so those who are being mentored will then mentor, you know, in, in that kind of sense. And I think it's about thinking it. It's it's different from some other protected characteristics in that you shift between different groups over mm -hmm. over the life course. Right. Um, and, and so I suppose it's about thinking about different responsibilities to others and networks at different kind of critical career mm -hmm. Um, um, junctions. And I suppose in addition to networks within Parliament, I mean, one of the big obstacles, which is, is good to hear, is, has not been as much an issue for you, but it's, of course, party, party partisan politics, mm -hmm. right? And the extent to which that, in a more kind of polarised politics, that inhibits women from making connections across parties as well as across generations. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose it's also about networks and connections out with the parliament and the kind yeah. of roles, you know, of the kinds of groups you've been talking about, et cetera, women's groups and, and youth groups can do out with the parliament also to, in terms of capacity building, in terms of networking, in terms of that wider kind of community. Yeah. Yeah. Grace? I would love to talk about the not competing yeah, with other people. Absolutely. So I think and this is maybe goes for life in general, but definitely um, if you're an older female MSP, just check yourself. Like, mm -hmm. I tell myself every day, and I actually think I've had the biggest positive change in my mental health when I started doing this, is reminding myself that other people's achievements, other people's beauty, other people's success does not ever take away from mine. Like, mm -hmm. it's the more the merrier. I want to see so many successful women doing their best, even if it's doing better than me, that is something to celebrate. Mm -hmm. It's not fun being at the top, 
by yourself. Um, so just welcoming positive change and being a friendly face and lifting each other up. By cutting other women down, you really only shine a negative light on yourself. Um, so I do just think everyone in every walk of life, but especially as women, because it's so difficult, because we do compete and we do compare, just check yourself and remember that just because someone else is doing a really great job doesn't mean that you're not as well. And I think if we all thought like that, things would get done faster and they would get done in a happier space. Yeah. Daniela, on either bit of that question. Um, I probably think sometimes we just lack a bit of empathy in society. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there is this trope of um, you quote unquote come from nothing, I guess, so you have no one and then you, get, you go up the ranks and you kind of forget where you came from. I feel like, I think we kind of need to stop that trope. Um, because you know what that person went through because you went through it yourself, so why not um, like, kind of lend your helping hand mm -hmm. type thing? Um, yeah, I genuinely just think empathy is one of the big things. Just sim not sympathy, but like relate to that young person because you know what they went through and kind of like, um, validate their feelings because sometimes it feels like oh maybe I'm the only person feeling this way in this place maybe everyone just went on with it and I'm just overreacting x y and z but you know validating their feelings telling them you know I went through this as well this is how I um kind of went w went through it no yeah yeah like went through it um this is things that I did to help myself just like empathy I, I guess yeah, so absolutely, it is something that's missing an awful lot from an awful lot of the conversations that we have. Um, so can the panel expand on what else institutions, organisations and government can and should be doing to tackle misogyny and violence against women online? It's a big, big question. And I think, I think for me, some of it is how we, how we deal with some of those things that people don't see as being as being below that threshold of being um, of being harmful and those microaggressions that we were talking about earlier, the number of times I get called a wee lassie on Twitter, 33. <laughs> and, it's, and if that's what I'm getting, I can only imagine <laughs> what younger women and girls are getting as well, if that's what they're doing to someone who's already elected and is very clearly not in our early 20s. Um, how, in your opinions, do we think that we, governments and institutions, we can tackle that? Because there's very, I think there's very different things that we would all do on a sort of societal level around education and things as well. But what do you think governments, organisations, institutions could do? Grace? Yeah. Um, so I will have a solid answer for you in April when I've submitted my dissertation, <laughs> because that's what this is on. Um, but I, like I think, especially like the post-pandemic times, the law has got to consider online spaces as public spaces. They are one and the same. So, um, for example, like an, an article was published about me last week and the torrent of abuse that I had was ridiculous. But if someone had shouted those things to me in the street, that would have been threatening and abusive behaviour under the Criminal Justice and Licensing Act. Why is it not one and the same? We, the law, yeah, the law has to consider um, that online spaces are public spaces. Furthermore, I'm really, really pleased to see that misogyny. Um, there's, there's a kind of proposal for it to be considered domestic terrorism because I absolutely agree that it is. And growing up in the age that I've grown up in. I can see it getting worse and worse every day, not even just on the news, but the things that people say to me, the attitudes that men have towards me, I can see it getting worse. Um, I'm also really pleased to see that there was scope for the Misogyny Act, yeah. a Scottish Parliament, so I am analysing that in great length and come back to me in April because I'll tell you then. But yeah, we have to treat misogyny as the serious public health issue that it is. Do you find the anonymity that people have on social media and the feeling that they that they have that ability to say things to you, do you find that quite scary? Yeah, I think that we now don't see other people as people anymore and we potentially don't see 
If, if people hiding behind online accounts don't think they're really saying that, I don't think they also appreciate that there's a person behind the other online account. Um, yeah, and they, but it, it scares me. I don't think it's a social media problem. It scares me that this is what people have always thought, but they've had to keep it inside. I think the fact that social media has become more prevalent is just showing us the extent of the problem that misogyny has always been. We can just, we can see it better now. We have a visual for it. Yeah. Um, Daniela. For me, I think there's two main problems with online spaces. The first one being um, an online space is simply a reflection of what we are as a society. That's what it is. It's just an amplification of what, like, society kind of enables, but you kind of are more free to do, do it on an online space because there is just less regulation there. And then secondly, I think... Um, oh, forgot that. Uh, secondly, I think a problem is um, it's hard to regulate because you're kind of... As an individual, it just depends on the way your algorithm is and the way you fall for it. Like, it just depends on what, like, for example, what two different ten-year-old boys interact with. One person might just interact with a bunch of memes. One boy might just click the wrong video, and that just spirals down into uh, years of misogyny. And I think mm -hmm. that is a problem. I think what we're not doing as a society is we're not educating in real life to stop them from amplifying online. And also online, we're not regulating what other people put out, such as Andrew Tate. Yeah. Why, why them as an individual, they have so much space, they have so much freedom to say whatever they want to say without any repercussions in any social media they want. Um, so yeah, I'd say, to answer your question, I'd say both educating and, and institutions such as schools, yep. um, definitely primary schools, younger end of like secondary schools and the younger you do it the better it is because it just creates a kind of a culture of like normalizing what is okay and what is not okay what is um like what is misogyny like just making those conversations more normal and then both in online spaces like you said just create having more regulations and just you know not like not normalizing what you wouldn't normalize in your day-to-day -day life so why would you do it online do you think we need to hold the social media companies Definitely. to account for the yeah. for the online radicalisation of these of these young people that the the platform they're giving to people like Andrew Tate is yeah. is happening? Um, I think more recently, um, not to shame like any social media companies, I think X has been really bad with it. Um, just the way, just the things you see on like even on my own personal algorithm. I go from like a funny video one second and then just pure abuse the next second. And it's like, why is there so much disparity to what I see? It's just because they're not taking it more, like these companies are not taking it more seriously. Like, yes, at the end of the day, it is the fault of the individual for saying those things, but like, why are they giving us space to say such things? Brilliant, thank you. Professor Kenny. Yeah, I think um, the starting point was really important, which is this is about a continuum of violence so that these are connected Right. Um, and that the kinds of microaggressions or other things, you know, that objectify or, or belittle or other um, contribute to making other forms of violence, um, uh, you know, more likely or exist within this, this, this continuum. And I think the kind of points made about education, about regulation of social media, about recognition in the first place. Um, but also, I think in terms of what institutions can do, there are, you know, there are dis um, debates and discussions around safety and security and, and, and whether that acknowledges things in terms of formal rules, in, again, in, in particular places or policies, um, how that relates to things like expenses and things like that and what you claim in terms of security and those kinds of things. But I suppose on the, the kind of last points, I would also say we're talking a lot about the representation of young women here, but I think we also need to talk about young men. Yeah. Um, and I think some of the, the, you know, data around kind of attitudes to gender equality and how those are shifting um, in younger generations around the relationship between younger voters and um, right, the far right and right wing parties. I mean, those are also things that are that are the other side of the coin and thinking about radicalization and, 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 and where these spaces are happening. And these are gendered phenomena that need unpicking. Yeah. And 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 recognition and investigation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and how that 
spills over into into elected politics is interesting. I don't know many women around the chamber now that don't don't carry a panic button um, when they're out and about by themselves. We're not allowed to be in off in regional offices ourselves, um, and all those sorts of things as well. And it's yeah, it certainly it certainly ticks up with more of a profile that that you get. But if that starts from from very early when you're living your whole lives through um, on social media and in this in this age, that's just going to going to magnify in an awful lot of places if you step into these these public roles as well. So following on from that, we've got a question. We've gone, we've done social media. We've got a question about conventional media as well. So what should the media's role be in empowering young women to enter politics? And I'm going to expand this out because when they get into politics as well is really important too. Should they adapt their coverage on men, women or both? And I think Again, have, to give you a wee second to think, having been, in, having been in here, there are certainly some journalists that are better than others and that I prefer speaking to over others, and especially my first few, few months and things as a, as a parliamentarian that were, some, that were very happy for me to fluff lines, mess up entirely, turn around and go, wasn't your best, we'll do that again, delete the file and let me do it again. Where are there, there are others that you know if you don't do things right, you're going to get caught out. They're going to repeat something. They're going to repeat something you said off the, off the cuff. So even once you get in there, just people being nicer would be, would be lovely. It's a very low bar. Um, so Grace, I think I'm going to come to you first, given your comments earlier on about your experience with, with the media. What do you think media outlets could be doing better? Obviously, we've had a lot of articles written about you, how many of those actually spoke to you <laughs> before those things were written about you? And of those that did speak to you, what are the good, bad or indifferent things that, that they've done or you think they should change? So it's funny because I think that a lot of stories that were running on me when I was younger, it was like young girl, little girl, school girl, like that was the kind of it was never woman, and yeah, I'm young, but I kind of was like infantilized by the words they used to describe me. And then I was doing a, a charity event last week, and the headline on me, which is nice, it was Stunning Straven Girl, which is very nice, but not really the point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, hype me up, but like, that's not really the point. And I am going to plug. Um, some, a Girl Guiding Scotland campaign that I created um, as a Speak Out champion when I was 15 and it's called Media Mindful and it's all about changing gender stereotypes in the media and we spoke to Nicola Sturgeon at Butte House um, mm -hmm. when she was First Minister and it was really, really good. She totally gave us the time of day to just hear everything she experienced about being like basically abused in the media, but also gave us space to kind of bounce our ideas off. So we came up with the Change the Headline Challenge. And it was the idea that we see a lot of headlines being run on women and it always just focuses on how they look. So like Angelina Jolie, of course she was married to Brad Pitt. That's right. Yeah. So she was, was married a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> time moves fast. Um but she was married to Brad Pitt and of course, she is beautiful, but she did a lot of charity work and the headlines always focused on the way that she looked. Um, or um, there were, oh, was it, what was the one? It was um, Theresa May and Brexit. Nicholas Sturgeon and it was Forget Brexit, who one, one legs it. it. So it was basically our challenge was on social media for people to post sexist headlines that they'd seen and change them into... Um, change them into more feminist ones. And I think, like, again, I'm kind of fortunate to be, like, white and middle class in this instance because sometimes people are really critiquing the way I look and sometimes they aren't, but it seems to be a topic of huge conversation in the media. I'm not really sure why. But I would love so much to just be seen as a person by traditional media outlets and not have a headline spun on my appearance that's basically clickbait. Yep. Um, yeah, because they wouldn't do that for a man. So if I, my engagement with um, 
traditional media has been positive. The comments from the general public reading that, not so much, but a lot of the time it's all about the way I look and not the things I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Daniela, what do you think the media's role is in empowering young women um, in, in politics? And how do you think they should, they should adapt their, their coverage to actually empower young women as well? I think their coverage is very telling because, for example, um, like you've said, like I'd prefer if you kind of focused on uh, like Theresa May's like policies of opposed her legs. Like I don't care about your legs. Like I want to know <laughs> what you bring to the table, right? But like for women, the focus on their looks, the focus on what they're wearing, yep. the focus how much everything costs. Oh, is your makeup melting? X, Y, and Z. But for men, it's like. For example, I'd say Boris Johnson's like, oh, he has funny hair, ha ha, like, things like that. Like, yeah. they're able to not be perfect and they're able for that being a like, kind of quirky, quirky personality for them that plays in their favour. But for women, like, you cannot step out of line, you cannot not be perfect. So I think even for both genders, we, I think we should just, like, move away from looks. Because I think mm -hmm. for men, it plays in their favour, um, it kind of like, you know, like, kind of not, f it makes it, like, it play. it's like an opposite role that it has for women. Like, for men, I feel like if you focus on their looks, people kind of forget about them and they kind of make them look like, oh, it's just a funny personality or just a funny yeah. wee guy type thing. But for women, it's like, oh, she can't even take care of herself. How can she take care of a country type thing? So mm -hmm. I think we should just move away from the looks and just what are they actually wanting to do for us as a society? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a that's a really important that's a really important point and one that we had in our in our chat before we before we came down as well. Um Professor Professor Kenny, there's obviously there's a whole load of panel shows and things like that that go around on around politics and things. Representation is not always the best, let alone equal. Um outside of that, there's often um, there's often a lot of the things that Grace and, and Danielle have just spoken about as well. So in terms of in terms of traditional media, and obviously we've we've kind of focused on on broadcast media and things as well, but there are also newspapers and things too. What should they be doing, or what should we be encouraging them to do um, to make that representation easier for young women and make them see themselves reflected in, in what's going on in the media? I think the numerical representation is a really important point because who's making content, who's presenting content and what content is featured. And in all of those, you see skews there in terms of there are more women or sorry, more men than women, um, you know, um, more white men, you know, um, uh, of particular class backgrounds and et cetera presenting. Um, and in terms of the experts they bring on in terms of the kinds of topics and that shapes the kinds of topics you're talking about as well. Um, and that in turn, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence around um, men get uh, ma male politicians get more media coverage than women, more positive media coverage often, um, and that women get this kind of stereotypical media coverage that's focused on their appearance or their looks, their their whether they have children, right? Um, uh, yeah. You know, mother of four, ex runs for um, uh, politics, um, but I think also. Um, in terms of the kind of particular dynamics there, that it's it's a kind of othering. Um, Nirmal Puar, who's a, who's a sociologist, has a really nice space, which is called, um, she talks about women and politicians of color as space invaders. They're walking into spaces that weren't designed for them. And that kind of othering of people in the media, which is look at what this person is wearing, look at what they're doing, is, is a kind of singling out of this, this doesn't belong here. This isn't, this isn't part of the kind of normalization of politics. And actually there was a really good, um, uh, year, a couple of years ago in one of Cameron's kind of cabinet reshuffles, the New Statesman did a parody, which was the flip side. And it was the fashion choices of men going into the cabinet to get their cabinet position. And it was, the headline was something like, uh, William Hague wore a suit, Philip Hammond wore a suit, Michael Gove wore a suit, and it was just these pictures. The and they're all like the same suit. The same. They're all, they never go to the same, same shop. Um, they're badly fitting uh, a lot of the time. Um, but, the, you know, it was this parade of navy kind of suits. And I think flipping that, you know, really does expose how, how ridiculous that would be if it were the, the other way around. Um, but I think also thinking about the, the youth dynamics 
that intersects with particular framings around young people, which is they are disaffected and not involved, or they're angry, or they're woke and, and destroying culture as we know it, right? Um, and, and that's a particular, that then compounds this, this underrepresentation, this lack of recognition of young people and particular groups of young people as groups that um, are, are, should be and represented in the representative process. So, so I think those things intersect with each other. Yeah. That's great. So where can young women go for support and information if they want to be more politically active? What have you found useful on your journey? Daniela? I kind of just I just kind of got stuck in. I just done it, I guess. Um, now, sometimes the approach you have to take in life, um, there won't always be resources for you. There won't always be someone to tell you what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Sometimes you just kind of have to figure it out yourself, and that's okay. That's the beauty of growing and learning, I guess. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, you know, I just kind of just done it I, um, because it's something I am passionate about. It's something I want to do. So although, yes, there are those barriers, although, yes, sometimes it does feel like, am I really cut out of doing this? Am I really the right person? Did I really get elected? Blah, blah. All these, like, negative thoughts. I'm like, I'm already here. I might as well just do it. So I just went with it. So yeah, and now I'm at a panel. <laughs> Fun, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, there's some weeks you wake up and go, oh, we're doing this. <laughs> and then you've got to go in and do it. And you sometimes look around for a more adulty adult and realise that you are an adult. It's terrible. Grace, what about you? I think, number one, get involved with organisations like the Young Women's Movement. Get involved with organisations like Girl Getting Scotland. Um, get involved with any like local youth council organisations. I never really did that, so I can't really um, speak for that. Parliament Scottish Youth Parliament for sure, but like Youth Council and um, even like going for things like House Captain, mm -hmm. etc. at school kind of gives you a flavour of how debate works and whatever, but absolutely always bear in mind, don't let the fear of looking stupid hold you back. I've made myself <laughs> look so stupid so many times but putting yourself out there consistently and learning and growing and understanding that you won't be perfect is definitely how I'm sitting here today. So just go after it. You know your stuff. Mm -hmm. You're like just walking in your shoes is enough experience that should be taken seriously. So just yeah. get up and go after it. Yeah. You're never going to be the last person to look daft. <laughs> and I think coming back to things later on as well is a really important one. If you don't know what you want to do now, I came into politics entirely by accident. I will bore you with that story later if you want um, after this. Um, but yeah, it's not, you don't have to know that you want to go into politics as soon as you come out of school and things as well. There's plenty of other things you can go and do and, and come back at a, different, at a different point while you are still in the bracket of being young, but maybe not as young as of, as both of the very accomplished young women we have on the on the panel, um, Professor Kenny, access to information is a huge, a huge barrier across socioeconomic groups and things as well in terms of where they get that information to be politically active and even that, even that want to be politically active. Are, we're needing to do. We're clearly needing to do more to make sure that that young women can can access infor, information. Where do you think we can do do better to ensure that they can access that information and reliable information as well? Because there is always that issue with putting things online of being able to trust sources and things as well. If you're not aware of who you can and can't trust. I think um, so. Some of the organisations that that work with trying to get uh, women into politics, etc., that all of the kind of spaces we've talked about here are important, but they're still probably most people would recognise them as small p politics. And I think it's about thinking a bit beyond those as well, um, and in particular for different kind of um, intersecting identities and where people might be. So, so thinking about engagement through things like faith groups and community groups and, and things beyond kind of, um, or alongside the kind of more um, uh, identifiably politically kind of involved groups um, and, and where to find people in spaces that are still political 
or yes. where power is happening, but might not see or identify as a kind of political space. Um, so I think that kind of outreach and mapping where people are, and, it, and it's often quite hard to do that from an institutional perspective because you're inevitably working from the perspective of people that are already in the institution, yeah, and it's about who isn't there, um, um, and thinking about things around faith and disability and location and mm -hmm. uh, immigration status and all kinds of things, um, and where would be the spaces to, to engage, yeah. Absolutely. So, Grace, you mentioned feeling respected and heard within the Young Women's Movement. Can you, or Daniela, give any examples of being made to feel safe in political spaces that are not exclusively for young women? Not really. <laughs> and that's a bit sad. Yeah, I was really thinking hard for a second. Not really. No. Daniela? I mean, I don't think it's explicitly making young women safe. Um, but within SVP, I think it's just the culture that we have kind of already covers that uh, on itself. So I think that is quite good. Um, we have like a believe, no tolerance policy. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just a no tolerance Perfect. policy. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think there is anything. Like I think it's quite similar to the anti-racism work I want to do because. Yes, there are things there that kind of cover that, but there's not really a focus on, like, um, like a certain like demographic or a group that should really be, kind of like pu pushed forward, such as ethnic minorities or young women or disabled young people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, I do recognise that SVP as a whole definitely has a culture that kind of protects young women and makes themselves feel space in places such like settings, for example, uh, like. Um, debates and things like that. So I would definitely say yes, but I don't think there is anything specific or explicitly that says that as of yet, that I'm aware of. I could be wrong. But yeah. What do you think would make some of the space, some of the political spaces that you're in feel safer that you're engaging in at the moment? If they don't feel safe at the moment, what, what do some of them need to do to make that safe for you? Um, I think that um political spaces, they need to go and see what the organisations that are making us feel safe are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I don't, maybe just like less pressure, less, um, being less demand, not demanding perfection, I think. And like everyone in that space, like as you move up through political institutions, having empathy, like Danielle said, um, I, I don't know how else to put it other than like we just need friendly faces to feel mm -hmm. welcome. Sometimes I feel like we don't even need to get into feeling safe, like we don't even feel welcome there. Um, and feeling, yeah, being like willing to be wrong or like, mm -hmm. yeah, being willing to take accountability when you don't know and um, like being comfortable with maybe being shown up by a young woman who might know something better than you. I don't really know how to articulate it, but I just think, like, let us be and we'll tell you what we need. Yeah, there's some people in this place that aren't very good at that either. <laughs> um, naming no names. Um, do, you think we've, do you think we've kind of forgotten the basics of just being welcoming, open, nice, friendly, and too focused on, on, other, on other things to actually get people in the door to some of these things, some of these political spaces and and keep them there in the in the first place. Yeah, I, th I think so. I think like kind of moving out of politics, but like in terms of I'm studying law, I'm really, really trying to be a lawyer. I'm always going to remember the friendly faces that I saw at law fairs, the people that gave me their email addresses, the people that said, hi, how are you? Um, like the established solicitors. And they, that's what made me want to go after that. And that's what made me feel like I could do that. Mm -hmm. So in spaces like this, a friendly, like, hi, how are you? My name is, shake hand, have a nice day. Like, that is all that we need to kind of build the basics of having a more equal parliament. Mm -hmm. Danielle? I'm happy to say that within SVP, I do feel safe as a young woman. Like, yeah. like that is something I am quite grateful for. How did they create that safe space? I think, I think it's like having things such as um, allowing people to step out of the room, 
um, like showing that, like having like having the confidence to be able to say or to stop like a conversation if you know that it's not going in the right direction. Just small things like that. Um, especially like you said, just a friendly face, like somebody nice. I think, like I said earlier, I think sometimes I feel like we're lacking a lot of empathy in society and I don't know why that is. I don't know if maybe it's because during COVID people just kind of like forgot to socialise and kind of like focus too much on like the internet, kind of forgot that there is real people behind that screen. Yeah. You're not just talking to like AI or something like that. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think just more empathetic and not being afraid to just like shut down conversations that are not just going in the right direction and are not benefiting anyone. Yeah. But yeah, and just be nice overall. Yeah. It's the absolute basics, isn't it? Uh, so we've got a few more that I might try and... Mm, maybe not. We'll do one more. Um, Scottish, Parliament, Scottish Youth Parliament membership is 55% young women, 6% non-binary and 38% young men. Why are more young women engaging in youth politics but not in other elected roles? And what could organisations like the Scottish Parliament learn from the Youth Parliament and the Young Women's Movement? Lots. Um, lots and lots and lots. Um, Professor Kenny. What Scottish Parliament could learn from some of these other institutions? I think we've had a lot of examples about ways of working and, and setting principles and both the combination of kind of formal principles and, and informal ways of working. I suppose that the, the, what happens in the political pipeline is that you, you, you can't just run for office, you have to be selected by a party, right? So, you know, a lot of the efforts on kind of getting women, including young women into politics, focus on training programs and kind of supply side stuff and become more confident and et cetera. But none of that will matter if you're not selected by a party. Yeah. And, and that particularly for young people, including young women, the kinds of networks you need in a party, um, the kind of local routes and, you know, perhaps in a constituency or depending on what kind of seat you're running for, what election, um, the kind of resources, et cetera, those are very hard to access. So I think going back is that the, the step in between some of those things is to look closer at parties and party cultures and what parties are doing, but also to encourage parties to take the action they can is key actors and representative democracies to increase um, representation of young people in other groups. Brilliant. So unfortunately we've run out of time. I think we could have been here for the rest of the afternoon if we'd been allowed. Um, so thank you for your contributions. But before we close, can you sum up sort of what the most, imp what the most important thing you think we've spoken about this afternoon is, is for you and what, your, what the biggest takeaways you think should be for for MSPs, for others, about how we how we ensure that young women can engage um, in Scottish politics and thrive within Scottish politics. <laughs> Professor Kenny, <I'm> like, <laughs> everybody else is avoiding my gaze. <laughs> <laughs> I made eye contact at a crucial moment. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so I think uh, I would say three things, which is. Um, that the underrepresentation of young people and their perspectives and interests undermines democratic legitimacy. Uh, two, that to one of the main obstacles to that representation is political parties, and they're both one of the main obstacles, but one of the main actors that can work to increase it. And three, uh, we need to think about what happens after young people are elected and supporting them in institutions so that they run again. Fabulous, Danielle. Yeah, I think there's like two main messages that, um, from this whole um, session today. I think one message is to the decision makers and the institutions in itself. I think, I will not lie, it is their job and it is their duty to kind of create that space for young women. Because at the moment, uh, it kind of feels like young women and other like demographics are kind of just there. But like they're in a space that is not really meant or was not created in the first place for them. So yet they might be there, but it does not suit them. Um, so I think it is their job to not only kind of amplify their voice, like, hey, look, this space, this pl this space is for you, but actually create a space that they can thrive in. And then the other message is to any young women here or anyone, if they happen to watch this, um, that 
just go for it. I'd say just you know yeah. put put your like don't don't let. It is okay to not like believe in yourself at times or to kind of doubt yourself. That is natural. We all humans do it, but don't let that hold yourself back from being or striving from being the great person that you can be. Brilliant, Grace. I think that we need to remember that young women are totally the future. And I think my message to young women would be, you are an expert in your own life. If there's something you don't like, get up and change it. Mm -hmm. um, if there's literally, any, it doesn't have, doesn't have to be to do with politics, but there, there's no limit to what you can do, but don't be afraid to get into that space and ask for what you need, because people don't always know. And don't be afraid to look stupid because it almost always is gonna pay off in your favor. Absolutely. So I'd like to thank you all for coming along today and making such a big contribution. And thank you for all of your questions and sorry we didn't get through them all. But I'd like to thank um, our panel, Professor Meryl Kenny, Grace McCabe and Daniela Onyewenyi for their insightful discussion and our partners at the Young Women's Movement and the Scottish Youth Parliament. Can you show them your appreciation in the usual way? Can I also remind you that there will be a survey that you'll receive automatically if you booked via Eventbrite, or we've got a few paper copies as well. We very much appreciate your thoughts on how to improve the festival for coming years. Can I take this opportunity to remind you that there are other festival events going on until Friday the 23rd of August. These include a panel tomorrow morning on young people and mental health at 10.45 a.m. and a discussion on artificial intelligence and deepfake politics at 11 a.m.